Hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining me um, in conversation today with renowned author Fiona McIntosh. My name's Melissa Tong and I have the pleasure to be your host today. I work with Macquarie Regional Library. Um, our event today is presented with the support of New South Wales Public Libraries Association and we thank them very much for their support. Today's event will run for approximately 50 minutes. Um, we've put you all on mute, um, but if you'd like to uh, ask uh, Fiona any questions, please use the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen um, and we will ask any of your questions on your behalf. Also, keep an eye on your screen today because we'll be running um, a poll throughout the session. Um, and if you've bought a copy of Fiona's latest book, The Spy's Wife, you'll have the chance to win a beautiful Hermes scarf. The winner will be contacted on Friday. So more about that later. Keep an eye on the screen. Welcome, Fiona. Oh, thank you. It's lovely. I wish I was standing on a stage in front of all your um, wonderful listeners, but uh, we have this technology, so I'm glad we can make use of it. And thank you for anyone who's out there and tuning in. It's lovely to be talking to you. Yes, yes, we have a lot of people joining us from all over the country today, which is fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. So before we start, I'd like to open today's event by acknowledging the traditional owners of this, of this land that I live and work on. Um, I'm here in Dubbo, and that's the Wiradjuri, uh, people of the Wiradjuri Nation. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal people of other nations from around Australia and pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. So, Fiona... Your latest book, The Spy's Wife, I'll give a little, a little teaser about the book. So your latest book is a high stakes historical thriller that keeps you second guessing until the very end. Um, can Evie play the spy's wife and save not only Max and Jonas, but save her country? It's a fabulous it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a, a fantastic <laughs> role for a woman to be in, actually. It's, it's sort of James Bondy. I didn't know it was going to become like that because <laughs> I don't really plan my stories. But, yeah, it, it became this rollicking adventure. Yes, and we will um, love to hear some more about that very soon. So for those who don't know, Fiona. Fiona McIntosh is an internationally best-selling author of novels for adults and children. She co-founded an award-winning travel magazine with her husband, which they ran for 15 years while raising their twin sons before she became a full-time author. Fiona roams the world researching and drawing inspiration for her novels and runs a series of highly respected fiction masterclasses. She calls South Australia home, and when she's not writing, she's reading or guiding others. She bakes and happily considers eating chocolate and drinking excellent coffee as hobbies. A okay. woman after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> the day is not a day until there's coffee. <laughs> I, uh, my word. Yeah. Um, so true. Or chocolate. You know. Chocolate true. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So welcome, Fiona. For those who haven't read, the Spy's Wife. Can you tell us a little bit more about it without giving too much away? Uh, I will try. The danger is I don't want to give too much away. Yes. It, is, it is a story about a woman who, it's a fish out of water story, and I do love those. So it's somebody who is suddenly plucked from the world that they've been living quietly, and this girl is a quiet, sleepy, mm. hollow kind of a girl, and she's thrust onto a, a more global stage um, one she doesn't want, um, but she's coerced into um, having to find out some information that um, Britain would uh, appreciate knowing. And she's, she can sort of pass unnoticed. Women in this time frame of the 1930s could pass unnoticed. They are simply wives or mothers. They're not that important. So um, Evie takes on that role and for good reason. And I'm, I won't spoil why, but, um, you know, she has to really strap on her James Bond 
And it's only Evie and one other person who really knows what's going on. The rest of the um, people all around her in the story are just enjoying the summer of 1936 and looking forward. And only the reader knows what's coming. Not even Evie and Max knows what's coming in a few years. So I love that. I love that the reader had information, but also Evie and Max have information and the rest of the cast don't. Yes, 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 which was fantastic because it did. You kept, I kept wondering how are they going to react to that when that happens? Or, yeah, yes, mm. it was very cleverly done. Yes, Thank you. Yes, yes, yeah. I also wanted to avoid war. I think because we were coming through um, 2019 bushfires and then we were all smacked with COVID, and it's been a really rough couple of years, not just for Australia, but the rest of the world. I made a deliberate effort to steer us away from war, but it is my favourite playground. And so I just kept us in that sort of un, that nervous position of, is war coming? Yes. Surely not, you know. And so I deliberately stayed in 1936 and in the summer um, yes. so that everyone's in frocks and going on picnics and eating ice cream. It's yes. only Evie who's tense. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 And... You know what? Um, uh, with Evie, when you started Evie's story, did you know she was going to to be so complex? Because you, you said she was this quiet, conservative, you know, young woman who'd been through quite a lot. But then, you know, she evolved into mm, this yeah. person that you know the things that she managed to do were just amazing. Well, I knew when I started with Evie as a character that she was going to come from this sleepy backwater and she was uh, deliberately unambitious and uh, she had no aspirations other than to run a railway station really well with her father. And she's yeah. doing that very well. She's in the parcels office or the ticket office or she's in the signals room. Yeah. She really knows how to run that station. And if anything happened to him, she could run it too. So she's competent. She's smart. We know she's yes. smart. We know we when we meet her, we know that she's listening to world news on the wireless. We know that she reads the newspaper with her father and she listens to the oratories coming out of Germany. She is very much in touch with the political landscape, but she has no desire to be involved in it. And I think that's how she becomes underestimated. Her, mm -hmm. her wit, her intelligence and her smarts are underestimated and that's what she needs. She needs them to be underestimated for when she is thrust on, into this situation of having to use all of them. But I deliberately had her without any training or skills that you would expect from someone who's put in this position. So she was never going to be an action woman. You know, she's not physically tough. Um, she's not... Uh, smart mouthed but she has got this agile mind that moves really quickly so she can think on her feet and I equipped her with that and that's really all she goes equipped with um, into Germany um, she's just thrust into that situation and she's got to use her own I suppose female cunning and um, her own smarts to just survive yes yes so yes. she does become very complex and I think that's that's, you know, every author wants that with their characters. They want them to have lots of layers. They want them to be very complex and engaging. And that makes them interesting for the reader to start discovering more and more and more about the characters. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because there was, there was a point in the beginning of the book where I sort of had gone, ah, oh, she's She's not going to, she can't be, she's not going to be the spy's wife, clearly, because, you know, she's, you know, she's met a man and suddenly they're going to get married and, you yeah. know, I can see a whole different life hmm. developing for her and then the story Kate. takes a complete, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, I love, I mean, there's a scene, I know, without wishing to ruin it for people, mm. there's a scene in London where I think we begin to really understand who Evie is um, yeah. And I think what it is, is that she decides that she's not going to be pushed around and um, she doesn't like unfairness and she feels everything about the situation that she's pushed into is unfair. It's coercement. Um, it's, it's almost treacherous with the way people are behaving. And she doesn't like that because Evie's a straight shooter. She's from, the, from Yorkshire, so she's a... Yeah. 
a straight talking northern lass who's strong mm -hmm. in her mind uh, may not look physically strong but she's strong in her mind and she resents it and so she just takes control she takes them all by the throat and I love that shift that we get and we get that glimpse that okay maybe just maybe um, she's going to be able to do what is required yes yes absolutely yes yeah and you know Evie, Evie and her sister, Rosie, were brought up um, by their widowed father, who's a station master at the Levisham Railway Station. And this was this is a little bit unorthodox, I thought, for that time, because, you know, a widowed father with two daughters, they're growing up in a, in a busy railway station with lots of strangers and men and, and, and everything. And, and I wondered why you chose the, that setting. The, the station and um, and was it a conscious decision because you knew that there were some skills that, that Evie had actually um, developed by living that life that helped her later on as well? Quite right. I mean, it's, it's all deliberate. There's nothing, yeah. um, you know, I wanted her to be without a mother figure in her life. So she becomes the mother figure yeah. in the story because of what's coming further down in the story. Yes. So I needed her to have that empathy with younger people because it's very important for the rest of the story. And um, I wanted her to be painted as someone who's not so much conservative because I think she's quite liberally minded, but, um, you know, she has to always be dutiful and that's her role is to be dutiful. And so whilst her sister is flirtatious and gregarious, I mean, she has to be sensible and loyal and do the work of two people. And I wanted her to present as this character because she's got to go through such a metamorphosis when um, she's thrown into Germany. And she's got to cast off that um, sort of shell um, because deep down, I think Evie is more um, colourful than I've allowed her to be painted on when she's at the station. But she's reticent and she recognises that reticence in Roger Hall when she first meets him. And she likes that about him. She thinks they're two little misfits who might have found each other. And so, yes, that was all very deliberate. Uh, I mean, as a writer, you've got to develop your characters. And while I do hand over to my characters, I have to make them interesting. And part of it is as they shed layers and the reader begins to say, oh, I really like how this character is coming along. Yes. So yes, it was unorthodox, but um, they wouldn't have been, their father loves them very much. And I doubt in any situation, he would have given up those girls, um, you know, to somebody else to raise. Yes. They were in a brilliant situation, a very safe situation. He had his eye on them all day long. Um, and Evie's not really young when we first meet her. I mean, she's already, uh, she's a widow. Yes. So she's yes. young, but she's widowed. So she's had some sort of life and she's got some sensibility about her and some sense of what it is to be a woman. Um, but she's had to basically raise her younger sister uh, with her father. So yes, that's deliberate. Yes, yeah, and you can you can sort of see those those skills that um, those attributes coming coming into play. Yeah, where she's she's essentially almost looked after her father and her sister. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so, who did somebody inspire the character of Evie? Is there, uh, no. a, is there a None famous of... spy out there? No, 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 no. I deliberately <gasps> steer away from that. Um, you know, I'm writing commercial fiction, so I do borrow a lot of characters from history and they're walking yes. through the pages of this book for sure. Yes. But my main characters will always be fictional because I don't want anyone to think, hmm, is she using me in this? Or um, this reminds me of my best friend. Or No, no, no. They're all composites. They're people I would like to meet or have around for dinner, but they're just, they're from my imagination. And I like that because it means I can take them anywhere I want them to go, um, that I can give them attributes, I can give them frailties, you know, I can give them poor habits. Anything I want to do with them, I can do. I don't want to be um, answering to someone's family who, who would say, no, my my great great grandmother was never like that. She would never have done that, you know. Um, so no, uh, absolutely, always yes. fictional. Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, what kinds of research do you do 
did you do for this book? Because, you know, there's a lot of historical information in there. Well, I've written about 13 of these really big historicals now, yeah. and they all take about two years in, their, wow. um, in how they come together. So two years out, I start the research. And it begins with reading. You have to... So the time is 1936. You can't just walk into 1936 and hope that everybody understands where they are and what's going on in the world. That's my job as the author, to build that world around my reader. So it's very important that I understand 1936, um, the political landscape of 1936 in Europe. Um, you know, I need to understand the fashions, the food, the music, the transport, the ways of life, the um, social pressures and how women were treated and, you know, absolutely everything. So I will read Tower of Books about the 1930s and then I'll bring it right down and I'll get very specific about 1936, mm -hmm. which is when this story takes place. And I will really enrich myself about the time. Um, and feel very confident yeah. as I begin to do the physical um, research, which is m me on the ground yeah. in every location of the story. I will never write a story if I haven't walked in the footsteps of my characters and where I'm going to put them. So that's one of my golden rules. And um, it's not just once either. I For the Champagne War, which was last year's book, yes. I went into Epinay four times. So I flew there four times to just add all the richness, all the textures, meet all the Champagne people, learn about growing, learn about the war, learn about making champagne. I mean, there is there is so much information I know that doesn't go into the book, but it makes me feel confident to write the book. So um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of reading and then it's a lot of physical uh, trudging around and finding all the perfect locations. Um, and in, in this book, it's, you know, it's uh, Levisham Railway, it's Scarborough, it's London, it's Paris, and then it's yeah. Berlin and Munich and Stuttgart. And uh, then I think we nip across and the Orient Express comes into the story. So I needed all of that. I needed to experience it and know it so that I could deliver it onto the page. It feels authentic then. Yeah. Yes. Well, it certainly does feel authentic. Yes. <laughs> That's quite a commitment. <laughs> It is, it I, is. Yes. And I guess your previous your previous life as a uh, travel writer um, and owning your travel magazine is probably really shows, shows there, yeah. Well, I think um, that opened my, I mean, I've been to so many places through my life in the travel publishing arena. Yeah. And what it means is that I'm not frightened to go anywhere, really. So if I want to set something in, Darjeeling we set a story in um, the tea gardens of Darjeeling I thought nothing of getting onto a flight to go to Calcutta and then travel yeah. you know it's quite a it's quite an undertaking to make that journey up to Darjeeling there's nothing easy about it um, and so uh, but it doesn't frighten me I just think well I want this story and I I need to put my boots on the ground um, in the tea gardens in Darjeeling and so I think it's the travel background that makes me, I don't want to say fearless, but I just think, oh, it's easy. There's nothing hard about this. Just get on a plane and go, you know, hire guides, yeah. hire a driver, do what you have to do, because I've been doing it all my life. So it's, it's not as overwhelming as perhaps somebody who's never traveled before suddenly thinking, I want to set a book in Morocco and how daunting that might feel to, to them saying, well, I'll need to go there. And yeah, I yeah. would say absolutely you would, because please don't try and write a novel from um, Google. Just don't. Just don't. <laughs> um, we might see. I can see that we've got some questions. So I'm just going to pop into the chat. Ah, So we've just got some questions here. So okay. this is from Fleur. Um, hi, Fiona. Do you associate with other authors as part of keeping your writing new and fresh? Associate. Um, do I? No, I don't. Well, I'll tell you how I do. I run a masterclass and this is for emerging writers and new writers and people who aren't sure about 
how do you write commercial fiction? How do you do this? I want to do it, but I don't know how to start. So they come to the masterclass and we spend five days together and I smack them around for those five days and get them into shape and put them on the right pathway so that they feel confident and motivated. And I have to admit that every time I see through another class, I feel invigorated with my own writing. They teach me so much. And I love the interaction that we have and the questions that they ask. They're like sponges. So they ask the sort of questions that sometimes you don't even think you should need to say, but if they're asking it, they want to know. So that is always very enlightening and um, it keeps me modest. It keeps my feet on the ground. But in terms of, am I out there sort of, smoking and drinking with other writers no I'm not I'm not I live in the middle of nowhere I'm incredibly busy and I know other writers are just the same you know we're we're sort of isolated creatures anyway you know we're, we're not people who want to necessarily have a big social life and I'm definitely not one for a social life so um no I'm not mixing if I went to a convention I would love it I would be you know, amazed to meet, um, you know, some favorite writers. But uh, no, I don't put myself out there a lot, but I'm with the masterclass. So I'm sort of seeing, you know, 60 or 70 new writers every year. Wow. So it's a lot of writers. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you you for that question. (laughs) Um, So another question from Julie if the spy's wife was made into a movie, who would you like to play Evie? Oh, gosh. I think I'd love somebody like Emily Blunt, somebody like that. Oh, yes, yes. You know, yeah. so she can play the more um, gentle character, but then that, that sort of tougher spine comes through. I'd love somebody like Emily Blunt. Um yeah, and let's hope that somebody's watching who does make movies and says, Do you know, we are going to make this into a movie. It would be lovely. It, would, it really lends itself because it's a, a fun story. My editor, when she read it, said, I can't believe how cheeky this story is, how lively it is, because I really did want that. We wanted to put something out there in the light rather than the doom and gloom of the trenches of yeah. the Champagne War and the great yeah. emotional heartbreak of the the champagne war we wanted something after the the fires and covid to have something that was more sunny so that as you were reading it you were rooting for someone and you were tense for someone and you were frightened for someone but you sort of feel she can do it and you're running with her you know you're running with her so it's it's got that sort of very lively sparkly quality to it um and that made it fun to write definitely Yes, yes. Well, well, maybe Emily will, will be watching. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Who you. Knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what drew you particularly to Yorkshire for, oh, for the setting for this God. particular? I, I think, you know, the northern half of England is absolutely magnificent. I mean, the, the landscapes are brilliant. And I've always had a bit of a thing for Yorkshire. I, I do love it. And so I'm always looking for an excuse to set a book in Yorkshire. And I've said, you know, the Pearl Thief wandered into Yorkshire. And um, I think another book is what uh, it'll come to me. Oh, yes, the Diamond Hunter wandered into Yorkshire. And now this one. I, in fact, I've got to stop myself going to Yorkshire now I'll have to think about Lancashire or something like that because it's not fair to just um, hone in one place but I just love the romantic but rugged landscape of Yorkshire and I I love the people up there Um, so it's just a helpless thing of mine I think and it's it's got that sort of uh, almost nostalgic childhood um, equality for me storybooks of my childhood I feel like they were all set in Yorkshire they weren't but that's how it feels so um, I do keep going back and back again and I promise that I will find a new location um, soon well certainly the mysteries of the moors is is very tempting isn't it what can you do what can you do it's wonderful you expect Heathcliff to come wandering over at any time that's right yes Oh. Um, so uh, 
still in Yorkshire. Um, you know, why was the information about the railway uh, so particular? Because that was what, you know, Roger Hall was, you know, that's mm. how we start. That's how Evie, Evie Metz meets Roger at the station because he's a spy for uh, the Germans. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought I could tell that bit because I thought, well, that's, that's, um, but why was that that so important? Because obviously you've done lots of research and, and I was just really curious as to what it was that at that time the Germans thought. Well, railways are very, very um, nostalgic for a start. So steam travel is fabulously nostalgic. And I, I dare anyone to get on a steam train, even today, a, you know, a tourist steam train and not have a silly smile on your face, you know, when you're chuff chuffing around. Yeah. And so um, I'd never written about the railways before. And I think in Britain um, during the Industrial Revolution, I mean, Britain was crisscrossed with railways, brilliant railways. And so I wanted to use that in the story. And I knew that railways were the way of moving heavy items around. I knew the Germans, were, I'd read a lot, the Germans were very interested in um, you know, building railways in, further into Eastern Europe. Um, and so that's why I thought, well, maybe I can give this character, the male character, he can be a railway engineer. That makes it plausible that he is traveling up and down the railway line and into the branch line because he loves railways anyway. And that's where they sort of find some common ground as well, that they're both you know, they love the railway. Yeah. So it, it just all worked in my mind. I'm always looking for fresh, freshness for the characters. Otherwise, they'll be too one dimensional if I keep sort of processing the same sort of character. So for Evie to have this special um, affinity with railways and for uh, Roger Hall to be a railway engineer, that hasn't appeared in any of my books before. No. So it felt fresh. And it also felt nostalgic and it felt right for the story that the Germans were going to be very interested in British railways and what the gauge was and if they invaded, what they would need to do to make it work for them. Yeah, this sort yeah. of thing was very important at the time. Yes, oh, thank you. Um, we'll take another question from the audience. So this one's from Joshua. Um, Fiona, it's heartwarming to attend one of your talks again even though it's not face-to-face. -face. I was wondering how many stories you find yourself contemplating at a time as you seem to get them written and out very quickly. Do you ever find yourself with writer's block? I've never had writer's block. Josh, hello first. Hello, Josh. Uh, thank you for that nice comment. Um, I've never had writer's block. I don't subscribe to it. I think it's... Um, I just think it's something in people's minds. It's also, I mean, it's probably a bit unfair to say this, but I sense it's also an excuse and perhaps driven by other things that are going on in your life. But for someone like me, where uh, life is ticking along uh, very nicely, there are no real outward problems other than what we're all facing, my mind is free to go wherever it wants to go. And I do have loads of ideas so that when my editor says, so what have we got coming up? I can say, I can do this or this or this. Do you want this or do you want that? And she just says, oh, I'd love something about that. And I can say, okay, no worries. I'll do that one then. So I've always got a dozen ideas I can throw at my editor and she can sort of be lucky dip or she can pick. So she can say, I'll leave it to you. Or she can just say, I, as she did, please write me the champagne story because she really wanted one about champagne. And so I just, I just do have this fertile imagination, loads of ideas and not just ideas for historicals, but ideas for crimes. Um, they're rattling around up there. And, but I don't try and deal with them all at the same time. They're all just little ideas that spin around. And when it's time, I bring one forward and think, can, how does that look? No, no, that's not ready. How does that one look? Oh, yeah, this sounds good. You know, so I know it sounds a bit crazy, but that's that's how it works for me. Um, and so I never allow myself to trip up over having too many stories. I just allow the main one to come through. And I have to tell you, they're never formed. They're always just this seed of an idea. Um, I might know where they're set. And I might know so loosely what they're about. There's not much. So for The Pearl Thief, 
I knew it was Prague and I knew it was going to be something about a woman who has been running away from trauma for, for more than 20 years, 25 years, she's been running from trauma. I didn't know what the trauma was. I didn't know who she was. I knew very little about the story until I went to Prague and thought, okay, where are you story? Come and find me. So I am a bit like that. I'm a bit arty farty like that. I just let the story find me. I let the characters come and find me and tap me on the shoulder and say, let's go, let's walk a while together. And so, yeah, I did never get overwhelmed by all the stories in my head. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing to, um, it's amazing to me that you can allow the story to come to you like that. And, yeah. and it does. You know, I sometimes sit down and have to write a report or something and it's like, oh. <laughs> so, oh, no. Yeah. It's, I think I'm just, I'm, I'm always in a hurry, but I'm someone who's always in a hurry. So, I just don't want to spend time thinking about it or plotting it. I just think, go to Paris and let it come to you. And, I, you know, that's how the Champagne War came about. I just, you know, my editor said, I'd love this story you're talking about, Champagne. And I said, well, I don't really know anything about it, but let's see. And I went to Epinay and just walked up and down for a while the streets. And I know my husband was saying, have you actually got a story? And I said, no, it's going to come. And I just have this confidence and I'm maybe – because I've written nearly, well, probably 40 books now, um, I the confidence is there that my modus operandi works for me. I don't panic and I don't worry. I just think it will come, and it does. Yes, yes, and it comes very well. <laughs> and we're very grateful that it does, <laughs> that we can step into these worlds. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you've answered a couple of my questions, um, you know, by telling us about your writing process. So, but you've mentioned before crime. So you do actually write in several genres. So fantasy, you have written for fantasy for adults and children, mm -hmm. crime and some nonfiction. Um, but the historical fiction is what you're currently writing, you know, um, a lot more of. So what is it about the historical fiction that that just grabs you? Well, historical fiction is what I always wanted to write. And when I was starting, setting out on this journey, um, I took a course with Bryce Courtney. Uh -huh. uh, so this is back in the year 2000. And uh, he, he just said to me, and I'd never attempted to write uh, any sort of story since childhood and I was trying to write commercial fiction and I know what it feels like now when my master classes arrive and say I want to write I don't know what I'm doing and I was that person and he said Fiona you are already a writer you just don't know it and you haven't actually sat down and written the story but he said I'll tell you this you're not going to write historical fiction for a long time and he knew that's what I wanted to do. He said, no, you're not ready. And I didn't know what he meant. He said, you'll know when you're ready. And I was like, oh, it was, felt like how long is a piece of string? And he said, what are you reading at the moment? And at the time, I was devouring really high quality fantasy. I was just trapped in that whole uh, genre. I thought it was brilliant. You know, the epic stories and the so much at stake. And he said, you go home and write that. So I wrote 14 big fantasy stories. And then I thought, okay, I know what he means now. I feel really ready to take on historical fiction because I'd written these 14 big books. I knew how to bolt together a story. I knew how to juggle a cast. I knew how to not lose sight of the main thrust of the, you know, yeah. the actual conflict in the story. Um, and I was, I was good at building the sort of tension through the story and the drama so people would turn the pages and so when I came to the moment of writing historical fiction I was already a pretty good writer and it meant that my very first piece of historical fiction uh, did very well um, and didn't feel like a real newbie arriving even though it was a brand new genre for me yeah. um, so Yes, I, I love historical fiction because I love history. And I feel every time I write a novel, I'm enriched for everything that I've learned, whether or not I've passed it on in, into the book. I feel enriched and I feel amazed by what I've learned. And, um, you know, it's nourishing to, to learn about the past and the past clues the future. I just love the, Yeah, and I love the nostalgia of it. I love the fashion. I love that there are no mobile phones. I love the good manners of 
past times. I'm not so conservative that I'm, you know, I'm purse-lipped, but I like playing with people who lived in those times. Um, it, it makes it more fun that you can't just pick up the phone and say, no, he's coming with a gun. You know, they've got to work it out for themselves. So I, I like playing in that arena. But I'm also writing crime at the moment as well. And I... Um, I'm a, a crime, I devour crime and I watch crime. Um, I can't get enough of crime. So for me, writing crime is a privilege. I love it. Um, and I'm doing more of that right now. In fact, I'm about to start the new crime novel for um, 2022. So it's, yeah, it's never far away. The Jack Hawksworth is never too far away. But you see, I think The Spy's Wife is a bit like a crime novel. It's got the it's, excitement of a crime yes. novel. And, you know, I went to the Spy Museum in Berlin and I found all these amazing um, um, tidbits connected with spycraft. And I, I tend to think of spies as in the Cold War. That's when we really had gadgets and, and bits and bobs like that. But no, they've been around since the ancient Greeks. You know, they've been moving information in clandestine means since that time. And I was just gobsmacked to see all these lovely little things I could play with, including the scarf. And that's why there's a scarf in my story. I found the scarf and I thought I have got to use that it's so very clever and so cunning who would think of a scarf being used in that way so um and that's why we have this herme scarf which floats through the story it's used as a plot point throughout the whole story yes. and that's why we're giving away a scarf of from hermes to somebody some lucky person who's um purchased a copy of the spy's wife who's listening <laughs> yes thank you um, so let's ask, let's get another question from the audience. Oh, so someone has asked, do you think you will ever write more fantasy books? And how do you, how do you find moving between the different genres? Uh, it's a good question. And thank you. I, you know, every, I get asked the question about fantasy most weeks. When will I go back to fantasy? Please, please. Look, I wrote those 14 big books and I'm very proud of them. I think they stand up to this day, whereas some fantasy gets old. I, 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 I hope no one thinks I'm being boastful, but each one of those trilogies has got real power behind it. They're still selling all over the world in various languages. And I think they keep bringing on a new generation of readers to them. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. However, um, those are big epic stories. There's about half a million words in each one. And at the moment, because my mind is crowded with stories of history and crime and some nonfiction, there's not a lot of room for the fantasy to get in and say, notice me. And until a great idea, there's one nibbling on the edge, but until a great idea stands up and sort of um, blazes into my consciousness and says, you know, you really should be writing me. Um, I'm going to say, I'll never say never, but at the moment there's no uh, plan for me to write more fantasy. I wish I could clone myself and say, that Fiona go off and just do fantasy and that Fiona go off and just write crime and this one can get on with historical, but I can't. So I'm juggling, you know, to write two books a year is an enormous uh, commitment for anyone, uh, particularly for the two year research period that um, the, the historical novels take and a crime novel takes about the same. I mean, I have to, Jack Hawksworth is London based. So I've always got to get to London. I've got to put my boots on the ground there and think about where are all these gritty urban locations going to be? Where are we going to find bodies, you know, and where does the killer live and where does Jack live now? And, you know, there's a lot of um, effort that goes into that, even though you think you just write a crime as quickly as ever. Um, I am, I am quick when I write, though. Once I say, okay, it's time to write, I've done all the research, it's time to write, I can usually write a book in about, you know, these days about 16 weeks. Wow. I used to be able, yeah, I used to be able to do it in about um, 10 to 12 weeks really fast. But now I take a bit longer. Um, there's more expectation. There's a bit more writing on my shoulders and a bit more writing on each book. So I take a bit longer, give myself a little bit longer to percolate some ideas. 
But do I struggle to move between them? Not at all. It's, it's like moving between your children. You know, this one does ballet and this one does footy. No, I, to me, I'm writing crime or I'm writing historical. I could be, wor I'm working on three books at a time, not writing them though. So I'll be writing one, I'll be researching another and I might be editing a different one altogether. So I compartmentalize very well, like a lot of women do. And I, um, you know, I just, it doesn't bother me to just switch from one genre to another. I, it never occurs to me to think, oh, will that bleed into that? Never, no. That's amazing. <laughs> so um, we're, we're almost running out of time. So oh, we need to tell everybody about the poll. So uh, we're launching the poll. So please go in and put your names in and um, answer the questions to win yourself a Hermes scarf. It's very exciting. Yes. <laughs> It's, it'll be beautiful. And they are a piece, oh. they're like an heirloom. You hand them down, you know. Hermes mm -hmm. is like having, I don't know, um, a, a Chanel suit or something yes. like that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so while everybody's doing the poll, let's move on and talking, I guess, I guess about the scarf, you know, I love the cover of this book, you know, the blue and the red and Evie hanging out the window. But I was curious, I sort of thought that there'd be the scarf there. No, I have to tell you the practical side of publishing. So right now I've written um, a new book that's coming out next year. I've handed it to my editor. This is the new historical for 2022. So she is now, as we speak, briefing in the artist about this story. And what tends to happen is that whilst I'm going through my editorial process, the graphics team is already deciding on the cover and coming back to all of us with, what do you think, what do you think? Now, when we found that um, image to use, uh, we hadn't settled in on the scarf. I had settled in on the scarf, but they didn't know about the scarf. So it's more a practical thing. You know, it's about timing. And also it's finding the girl wearing a scarf. You know, yeah, I know yeah. it sounds very easy, but we'd have to probably go and shoot that photograph if you wanted, you know, the real EV standing out in, on a platform wearing the scarf. You know, you, you'd have to go to full production and get Steven Spielberg in to actually create that for you. So yes. we do our best, yeah, but yeah. the scarf... Um, yeah, it sort of, um, I, I had it in mind and was writing it in, but the graphics team didn't know about that yet. Yes. Well, it's interesting to know. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we'll do some more Q&A. Okay. Um, uh, so this one's from Helen. Have any of your books made it into movies? Well, Helen, um, we've recently this year heard that the whole world of Jack Hawksworth, which is my, my series of crime novels, has been optioned for um, television. So extremely excited about that. It just means that Jack is going to be, fingers crossed, walking around alive on television, on our screens sometime soon. But because of COVID, we're having to think about maybe we need to bring him out to Australia so that we can shoot it locally. Um, and then when the world opens up and everyone's feeling a lot safer about travel from Australia elsewhere, um, we can think about the rest of the stories. But yes, will the historicals be made into movies? I think there is such an appetite now for streaming drama. We are, as a, as a world, we are devouring stories on the screen. And they, you will note, it's no longer just written by people writing for television. If you watch the credits roll, this is always adapted from a book by or, you know, based on the book by. So the very best stories on Netflix or Prime or Apple right now are coming out of books. Absolutely. So there's a, there's a real appetite for film producers and directors to be looking at really popular books to look for the original material. And I think that, yes, there'll be door knocks in the not too distant future, even for me. So I have very high hopes that we'll have some good news soon. Yeah. Well, we look forward to that. <laughs> um, so 
someone has asked, how did you get a seat on the Orient Express? Was it going to, was, was it going, the trip going to Istanbul? Um, I have to, the Orient Express was brought in to be super romantic and nostalgic. Now, for my honeymoon, I travelled on the Orient Express between Venice and Paris, and it was incredible. And I wanted to bring that into the story. Now, everywhere else, I'd put my feet on the ground, but it was March 2020 when I was in Germany. Um, and I, I was just in Munich finishing up, and we were getting news of this virus that had come out of China and was now beginning to rage across Europe because Milan had already closed down. And it spooked us slightly because we were hearing reports that Australia was a bit nervous about this. And Australians, if they were abroad, should think about getting home. And so, you know, I couldn't take a trip on the Orient Express for this story. It's one of the rare times I didn't do that. But everywhere else in the story, I went to Paris, I went to London, I went to York. Uh, Munich, went. Stuttgart, Berlin. I even, to, um, I even went to uh, Nuremberg because I thought maybe I could put a rally in there, but I had too much material. And I even went to Lithuania because I thought, well, maybe I could do it. I could take this story into Eastern Europe. I really, I, I tried to cover all the bases, but we had to get home. So there was no time to do any train travel. And so luckily that trip on the Orient Express for my honeymoon, I've got loads of pictures and loads of you know visuals and very good memories, of course, very romantic memories. And so I was able to pile that into the story. Yeah. Mm. Um, this one's from Jill. You sometimes write in the first person and others in the third person. How do you choose and why? Um, you know, it's how I hear it. It's how I hear the story. So the tea gardens, I had to write in first person. I don't know why it just, that was who she needed to be. Um, and I needed to, for us to inhabit that character to feel her terrible pain and sense of loss in that story. And so I, I just slipped into first person. It's not my favorite form of writing. It is the most intimate and it is the most powerful, but I like to be everyone in the story. I want to be, you know, Evie, but I also want to be uh, Roger and I want to be the villain and I want to be Adolf Hitler in the story. I want to be all those characters. And so I tend to prefer third person. So that's my, that's where I go to as a matter of course, but just sometimes a book requires that intimacy that for only first person can give you. And so when I know that I'm cornered and we really need that pain to be felt or that, that particular person's mind to be very open to the reader, then I'll go into first person. Thank you. Um, so another question. So someone's just noticed on your bookshelf the covers of all your recent novels have the main characters wearing red. Any uh -huh. particular reason? No, I don't know. We're on this thing at the moment, uh, me and Penguin. We like girls in red dresses on our front cover. Um, I know we have to stop doing that. And normally when I appear on one of these things, I'm dressed in red with bright red lipstick just to sort of make you all laugh. But it's so cold in South Australia today and it's pouring with rain outside that I needed to wear something with long sleeves and, and feel a bit warmer. But... Uh, yes, the girls in the red dress are a bit of a trademark for me, um, but I guess we will start to change that maybe from the next book because we've, we have done it quite a lot. Um, but they do, she does stand out. I mean, Evie really stands out on the cover in that scarlet dress. And it's, I wanted her to, it's about who the character is as well. You've got to remember, this is a character who's uh, reticent and shy and as I started out saying, she isn't very gregarious, but she has to portray a character like that. So she's in that scarlet dress to sort of sh to show this. I'm not frightened of anything. I'm really loud. I'm a bit of a party girl. Look um, at me. Yeah, look at me when she really isn't. Um, and so that's her still in character when we see her on that train. Yes, yes. yes. And what a great character it is. <laughs> um, so... Oh, let's ask some other questions here. 
Uh, so what advice do you give to a beginner writers who haven't written a book, haven't written a book yet, but are engaging in creative writing with library writing groups? Um, I think not to be scared. Look, it's very easy to um, talk yourself out of it. And there's also a danger, I think, that new writers or people who aspire to write spend a lot of time in writing groups and talking about writing and, you know, beginning to think, you know, do I need an agent? And I wonder who's going to publish me. I mean, that is all in the far-flung future. Forget about all of that. You need a manuscript to begin with, and you need a polished manuscript. You need 100,000 words that's been edited and polished and finessed because you're going to get one shot at this with a publisher. They won't want to see it again if they reject it. So you need it to be the best it can be. So get on with it and write the book. Have a go. You're not going to do your best work straight away. It's going to take some practice. And every time you finish a novel, uh, you're going to learn something from that manuscript. And even if you go back and edit that same novel, you're going to learn something from the process of editing. I think I said earlier, every book of mine is better than the last book. And that's because I'm learning. I don't stop learning just because I've written 40 books. I just think technically I get better and better at what I do. And you will too. And every rejection will make you better. But you're not going to get anywhere if you're not going to get on and write a book. So you can talk it up all you like and you can dream about it all you like. But until you actually write it, you're never going to get anywhere with this dream to pull it out of the clouds and make it reality. And I think that's what my masterclass aims to do. It sits everybody down and the dragon begins to breathe her fire and begins to make them understand what it is to write commercial fiction. Um, you know, it's work, it's hard work, and you've got to get on with it. And to write, as I say on my How to Write Your Blockbuster book, which you can borrow from any library, it's a verb. To write is a verb, and it means that's an action word. So get on with it. Stop talking about it. Do it is my best advice. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, it's a fabulous question here from John. So given the way you write your books, do you find that halfway through a novel that you may have to start again and rewrite the, oh their God, character? No, 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 absolutely not. Sorry, Sorry John. John. I know I sound horrified, but that would just, uh, um, I don't think I'd ever write again if I was writing like that. No, absolutely not. Do I have to stop halfway through and think this is not working? Because you have to remember, I've been working on something for sort of almost two years, like 18 months before I actually, yeah, 18 months, maybe not that long, maybe 15 months before I sit down and say, write it. So I've, this character has, all these characters have been percolating and coming towards me and building themselves. And finally, back of brain releases them onto the page. So I'm always intrigued that they are as complete as they are. But I've learned not to be surprised because I've done, I've done the hard yards with them without really knowing it. So um, I never go at the, you know, go at the book half cocked, but at the same time, I don't waste time. Now, something that did happen to me along the lines of what you're talking about, John, but not stopping halfway and being panicked, but it was, I wrote The Champagne War and I delivered it to my editor and she read it and she loved it. And she said, this, I love it. We could publish it, but there's just something not quite right. Not quite, it's not like you, Fiona. So she passed it out to all the other editors in the publishing house and they all read it and they said, oh no, it's a typical Fiona, you know, it's great. But Ali still kept thinking about it. And then she gave it to a junior editor, her offsider, who'd never worked on one of my books. And um, she read it and she said, oh, look, it's, look, it's lovely. It's beautiful. And, and Ali said, but what? And um, she found the courage to say, but Fiona always gives us a villain that we can hiss and boo at. There's always someone that we're going to really love or enjoy hating in the story. And Ali said, oh. And then she told me, just as a passing remark, and as I've said before, it was like the heavens opened and a chorus of angels started blowing trumpets because it all made sense to me. And what I did the minute I heard that, was go back to the beginning and I rewrote the whole story by writing in a character called Louis. And when I'd finished it, all of us said, 
how could we have ever read this book without Louis in it? Because he's so important to the story. So that was one moment where I've done that. It's the only book it's happened to me on, but I've never stopped halfway through ever and trashed a book. No, never. Um, and I'm going to remove that from my mind because it's never going to happen either because there's too much work to be halfway through 50,000 words in and thinking this is rubbish no absolutely not no. thank you John <laughs> so we've uh, we just I thought we'll just do um two more questions um so uh because it's time to wrap up so okay so for some of your crime fans, um, someone would like to know what crime shows do you like to watch? And and I guess a second part of that is who are your favourite favorite crime writers? Crime writers. Um, look, I, I actually love thrillers. So if anyone hasn't read I Am Pilgrim, for example, um, by Terry Hayes, I think it is. You need to read that. I love big thrillers, but I love any sort of crime. And I'm I'm in a bit of a Joe Nesbo moment. I've been oh, reading a lot of Joe Nesbo, um, and I'd never read him before. But look, I love um, I love all crime writers. I don't John Connolly. I think he's a crime writer, but he's also masquerading as a crime writer because he's got this element of the. Um, almost paranormal and horror in there. I love um, Stephen King's, he's evolved and he's no longer writing just straight out horror. He's writing sort of serial killer kind of stories and they're fantastic because they've got all the trademark Stephen King in it, but they're brilliant because he's such a clever storyteller. So I'll devour anything that is really high quality crime. Um, in terms of what I watch, I like... Uh, British um, crime shows, you know, Line of Duty, this sort of thing. Um, anything British I will devour, um, but I also love all the Scandi Noir. I'll watch anything that is Scandi Noir on Netflix and every other platform. I've got them all. Amazon Prime, Binge, I've got Netflix, I've got Apple. Um, I've tried BritBox. I've got everything because I just consume it. And I think if, and I curate it as well. So I go through one of my great joys is going through and seeing what's new. SBS iView gets brilliant stuff. So I go through it all and I mark it up um, so that when my husband comes to sit down with me, I can say, oh, we're doing this tonight or we're going to start this show. Um, and he always thinks, wow, it's such good quality, but that's because I've been through it all. I've discarded what I think isn't up to par for me. And then we watch really high quality storytelling because I think it informs me, it teaches me. So as I'm watching really good drama, like The Crown or, you know, or, or some good Scandi Noir for my crimes, it's teaching me, it, a back of brain is taking it all in. So, yeah, I mean, I just devour as I go along, particularly, um, you know, streaming drama, Temple on SBS iView. It's, I've got so many addictive shows and I just, ro uh, you know, roar through them. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so binge, binge watching. Yeah. Um, one last question, just because I, I find this interesting. This is from Lynn. Would you consider writing a book set in Australia? I have. So, Lynn, thank you for that question. Um, COVID struck, you know, March 2020. We're all in lockdown and it's around March, April every year because I'm busy beginning to write the new story in March, April. And it's around that time that we contract with my publisher, for the book in two years time. I hope that all makes sense to you. So in March, 2020, my editor was saying to me, what will you be writing for 2022? And I, I realized we were all in lockdown and we were all in fear. Like we were all in fright. The world yeah. was frigid fear because we didn't know what this thing was all about, how it was gonna change our lives. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know what the shape of it was going to be. And so I realized I couldn't, not only could I not travel abroad and I only write stories set in far flung places because that's part of my thing is that I will armchair travel you to far flung places in my stories. I couldn't get on a flight to race abroad, but I also couldn't cross my own border. 
I couldn't get into Tasmania or Queensland. I couldn't go anywhere. So I had to write, a, I had to say to my editor, it will be an Australian story and it will be a South Australian story. And then I thought, what am I going to do? I had no idea for it, but I've delivered that story. It's finished and it's been delivered and she absolutely adores it. She's already come back and I'm now presently working on the second draft of that story and it's called The Orphans and it's set in South Australia. Oh, it's one to watch. How exciting. (laughs) Yeah, coming next year. (laughs) Well, it's time for us to wrap up. I can't believe it's been an hour. We've had such a great time. Yes. So thank thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories that captivate us and for joining us today. And thank you for to the New South Wales Public Library Association for their support in presenting this event. Um, Thank you to the audience for for continually reading and supporting libraries and authors. Um, And we remind you that Fiona's book is available at all good bookstores and libraries. (laughs) Um, And here in Dubbo, that bookstore is the Book Connection. I always like to give them a shout out. Um, Absolutely. Yes. So go to your local library and borrow or go to the bookstore and read. And for anybody who has done the poll, good luck. I hope that you're the the winner. I wish I was, but (laughs) I'm not allowed to. (laughs) Me too. Enjoy it, whoever wins. And enjoy the story. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you, thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you about your new new crime novels and The Orphans next year, perhaps. Next year, for sure. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.